Turn with me to Exodus chapter 3 today. Exodus chapter 3. You know, <clears throat> we left Moses out there in the wilderness tending the sheep. He's um, herding sheep. Last time we talked about the lessons, leadership lessons you can learn from sheep. So after 40 years of herding these sheep out there, we're going to pick up the story in Exodus chapter 3 where Moses comes and meets God and, and meets with God at the burning bush. Let's just read uh, the first part of this chapter starting in verse 1. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now there's something interesting about Horeb. If you uh, do some, some research on Mount Horeb, you'll find that that's the same mountain as, as Mount Sinai, I believe. It was the mountain where, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the law, and all that. Uh, so it's a very special place. So that's where Moses was, was on Mount Horeb. And verse 2 says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush, bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Okay, let's just stop right there. Notice that God didn't tell Moses that he was sending an army with him. He sent him off with his staff. But he said he's going to go with him. When he got to, to Egypt, as God had predicted... Pharaoh was not interested in letting the people go. So God performed 10 miraculous signs in Egypt. Now, I want to focus this morning on why. Why the plagues in Egypt? Why did God do that? There were 10 of them, and I'm not going to take time to read through all of them. I hope I generate enough curiosity within you that you'll go home and read them for yourself. But there were 10 plagues that God brought on the Egyptians. Here's the ten. He turned the Nile River into blood. He brought frogs on the land. There were frogs everywhere. He brought swarms of gnats, flies, disease on their cattle, boils and sores on men and animals. He brought destruction of crops and cattle by hail. He brought destruction of crops by locusts. He brought darkness. There's darkness so thick you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I mean, have you ever been where it's that dark? I mean, no light at all. Darkness, total darkness. And then finally, he brought the death of the firstborn. So, what was the purpose? What was God trying to accomplish by bringing these ten plagues on the Egyptians? Have you ever thought of that? You know, there's one thing that always bugged me about this passage of Scripture. Um, there was one thing that I, I, I struggled with for a long time that I couldn't really grasp and couldn't really understand. It says three different times, not once, not twice, but three times, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Huh. I thought God wanted our hearts to be soft, didn't you? 
Why would God harden somebody's heart? We find it in chapter 9, verse 12. It says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Okay, we find it again if we turn the page over to verse chapter 10. It's twice in chapter 10, verse 20. It says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. And then again in 27, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Why in the world? Why in the world would God do that? Somehow that never did really fit into my paradigm of things, that God would harden somebody's heart. Why wouldn't he soften somebody's heart? Why wouldn't he draw somebody to him? Why would he harden somebody's heart and draw them further away from him? Why would God do that? Until I understood this. One of the purposes, one of the purposes for God bringing the plagues on Egypt was to bring judgment on the Egyptians for their false gods. To bring judgment on the Egyptians for their false gods. You know, God said the first commandment was, you shall have no other gods before me. Why was that the first commandment? I think that's the most important commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. God is a jealous God. He desires to have 100%, 100% of our allegiance. Whenever we put something else or someone else in front of God, um, there's always consequences. You know, the very first plague was the Nile River, turned the Nile into blood. And God said something interesting to, to Moses. He said, Moses, I want you to go out and meet Pharaoh in the morning when he goes down to the Nile River. How did God know Pharaoh was going to go down to the Nile in the morning? Because the Nile, they worshiped the Nile River. He would go down in the mor every morning and worship the Nile River. And God said, go meet him there. And he turned their object of worship into blood. Turned it into blood. We know that God was doing this because he tells us in a couple different passages in Exodus 12, 12. He says, on that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Again, in Numbers, it gives the account again. He says, the Lord had struck down among them, for the Lord had brought judgment on their gods. So the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. You know, they had a frog god. So God infested them with frogs. They had a bull god. So God brought disease on their cattle. They had a healing god. So God sent boils on them. They had this god they called Seth, the protector of crops. So God brought destruction by hail and locusts. They had a sun god. They worshipped the sun. So God brought darkness. And Pharaoh himself was considered a god. So God brought judgment on their firstborn. But I believe not only did the Egyptians need a wake-up call, I think the Israelites themselves did too. Remember, they had been in this society for 400 years. They had been very heavily influenced by this culture for 400 years. In fact, Joshua 24, 14 says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. This was long after they had left Egypt. And Joshua says, get rid of those gods you worshipped back there in Egypt. They had been influenced by those gods. And so God was showing himself strong to the Israelite people as well and saying, these gods are worthless. These gods are worthless. I am. Remember what he says to Moses before Moses went down there when Moses asked, what shall I say when I get there? Who shall I say sent me? And God said, Tell them, I am has sent you. I am has sent you. So let's think about that a little bit. God brought those plagues onto Egypt to discredit the gods of Egypt. Could God do the same thing in our day? Could God do the same thing to America? Think about it a little bit. The strength of America has been our financial institution, our great wealth. Our wealth has become our God. 
Why do you think the Twin Towers came down on 9-11? That was a symbol of our great wealth. It didn't stop there. It continued with the stock market crash in 2008. God was trying to get our attention, and I don't think he's done yet. I don't know what's coming, but I don't think he's done yet. Did you know that China recently overtook us as the largest economy in the world? All kinds of things have happened and will continue to happen. When a nation forgets God and raises up other gods, God has a way of taking those things out. But let's bring it on down to a personal level. A personal level. What is happening on a personal level in your life? Do you have other gods that you've put ahead of God? Is there something in your life that is getting between you and God? What is it that God's talking to you about that you need to get rid of? Remember the story of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus? He came to Jesus and said, Lord, Jesus, what do I need to do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, uh, um, you know, you need to obey the commandments, love God and love others. And he said, well, I've done that. You know, I've done all that from my youth. I've, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. And he told the young ruler, he said, well, you need to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, he didn't tell everybody that. But for this guy, he told him that because he knew it was his wealth that kept him from God. And he knew that that was the thing. That was the thing that was blocking him from being saved. That's not that way for everybody. Some people can have great wealth and it's not a problem. But for this particular young person, it says he went away sad because he had great wealth. For you, it, it may not be wealth. It may be something totally different. It may be, it may be a hobby. It may be, it may be your work. It may be whatever it is. What are you putting ahead of God? I think that's the lesson in that, that God came against the Egyptians because they had put things ahead of him. They had put things ahead of him. Let's go to the second reason that I think. I think there's six of these. There's the second one. It was a demonstration of God's power. Moses, or God had said to Moses, he said, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. It was a demonstration of God's power. There's some verses in chapter 9 I want to share as well. Where the Lord said to Moses, said, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. He's saying, I could have. I got the power. I could have just wiped you off the earth. But he said, I want you to know something. I want you to learn something through this. I want you to see that I am the powerful one that I am the God of the universe verse 16 but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth hmm. so God was saying he was working through Pharaoh hardening Pharaoh's heart for a purpose to show his power could that possibly be happening in our world today? I look at some of the crazy uh, things that are happening in our world, some of the crazy decisions that our leaders are making, like making a nuclear deal with Iran, um, you know, becoming friendly with Cuba, with the dictators, the brutal dictators of Cuba. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, last week, the... Congress voted down a bill that would have shut down the biggest murder machine in history, Planned Parenthood. And, you know, they're killing a million babies a year and selling their parts. And our Congress um, voted to keep them in business. 
hmm, could God be hardening their hearts so that he can show his power in some way? That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? He did it in Egypt. He did it in Egypt. See, when God's about to do something, when God's about to do something great, he performs some great miracles. He did it at the time of creation. He did it at the flood. He did it at Egypt. He did it when Jesus was coming to earth. He's, going, he's doing it again. He's going to do it again, okay, at his second coming. A demonstration of God's power. The third thing is, it was punishment of Egypt for their harsh treatment of the Israelites. Years and years before this, 500 years before this, God had said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Then he went on in Genesis 15, he said, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, because he had told Abraham, there's going to come a time when your descendants are going to be taken into Egypt, and they're going to be served as slaves for a period of time. Then he says, I will punish that nation for doing that to them. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Lord, have mercy on the nation that turns their back on Israel. You know, I've, a couple of weeks ago, I listed some of the atrocities that have happened to the Jewish people over the years. And we see it happening again. We're not far from another war in the Middle East. Recently, the president of Turkey called for Muslim Sunni and Shia to join together and invade Israel. The interesting thing is the Bible tells us that's exactly what's going to happen. We can go to Ezekiel, we can go to Psalms, we can go to Revelation. We can look at all those scriptures where the Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen, but it's going to be a horrendous time for the Israelites, but it says God is going to come, and he's going to intervene in the end, and he's going to destroy those nations that come against Israel. Over 3,000 years ago, the Bible tells us exactly what is happening today. Today. That brings us to the fourth one, and usually this is the first one we think of when we think about why God brought the plagues against the Egyptians. We think of this one. They, they motivated Pharaoh to release the Israelites. We usually think of that first. You know, when tyrants have slaves, they never easily give them up. I mean, our nation fought a civil war about that, right? Um, 150 years ago. Tyrants never give up easily. But God had said to Moses in Exodus 3, 19 and 20, he says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him or motivates him to let you go. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. So God chose to inflict so much pain and suffering on the Egyptians that the pain of losing their slaves was less than the pain of, that they were enduring. And finally they said, go, go, get out of here. And not only that, here, take some silver, take some gold. It says they left with great wealth because the Egyptians gave it to them and said, get out of here, go. They were ready for him to leave. It motivated Pharaoh to release them. The fifth thing is they were a sample of God's future judgment on all mankind. You know, God's so often awesome. Everything he does, everything he does, Everything is recorded in the Bible has two or three different meanings. Here he was 3,000 years ago, or whatever it was, with these plagues on Egypt. But it was a foreshadowing of what is to come in the future. If we go to, all the way to the book of Revelation, where it talks about John seeing this vision. And in this vision, he sees this. He says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. It talks about a time when God will bring those plagues onto the whole earth as well. See, when God gets ready to call his people out, when God gets ready to bring them to him in heaven, he'll initiate these plagues for several reasons, just like he did in Egypt. In Egypt, 
It was to judge the gods of the age. I think God's going to do that again. It was to show his mighty power to the people so that they would turn to him, so that they would recognize that he is the God of the universe. Over and over again in Revelation, it talks about when God brings these plagues on the, onto the earth. And then it says, and the people still didn't repent. It tells us that the people had the opportunity to repent. They had their opportunity to return to God. That was the purpose of the plagues, but many didn't. I'm sure some did, or some will. Uh, the third thing was to punish those who live in wickedness. And then to call his people out and take them, them home. Just like he called the Israelites out of Egypt to take them to the promised land. He's going to call us out to take us home. He's going to call us out through the rapture to meet him in the air. Brings us to the last plague. And this one's probably the worst one, probably the most horrendous one, where the firstborn in every house would die unless they would have the blood applied to the doorpost. I think this, it culminates in a foreshadowing of Jesus. A foreshadowing of Jesus. Here's how it went down. God came through Moses and he said, you tell your people, you tell the Israelites that here's what they were supposed to do. They're supposed to go out and they're supposed to kill a lamb. Now remember, this was before there was all the law and all the sacrifices and all that. That didn't come till later. But he told them, you're going to, your, your people are supposed to go out and select a lamb. Not just any lamb, a perfect lamb take it into their house and keep it for I believe it was four days and then they're supposed to slaughter that lamb and eat that lamb but take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost the side and the top of the door of every house here's what God says in Exodus 12:13. It says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. It says, I will pass over you. That's where we get the word Passover. So when the death angel came, can you imagine living in that house? You had just seen the other nine plagues. You had just seen what God can do. And now God says, you're going to have somebody die in each house, the firstborn in each house, and you're sitting in there with your family. Maybe you've got a firstborn child, a son or a daughter, and you're sitting there, and you're wondering, is this really going to work? Will this really? Is God really going to do this? Is he really good for his word? When he sees that blood, he will pass over. Look at the next verse. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame. And will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. He will pass over. He will not permit the destroyer. He will not allow the destroyer to come in. I'll bet if you were been there, you'd have been sure there would have been blood on those doorposts. If you'd have been that child, maybe you're 10, 11, 12 years old, you heard about this. I bet you'd have gone out and checked at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock to make sure that blood is on that doorpost. We know that it did happen. The death angel did come through. In the Egyptian cities, the firstborn died. But in the Israelite camp, Nobody died because they had done what they'd, God had told them to do. That is a picture of what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us this morning. That is a picture of what that blood does for us. Because all of us, all of us are condemned because of sin in our life. All of us have sin in our life. And because of that, 
were condemned to death. But Jesus says, if you, if you apply the blood, if you apply the blood, he will not permit the destroyer to come. Look at this, these verses in 1 Peter. It says, For you know that it is not without perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Just like they had to, had to pick a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus Christ is our lamb without blemish or defect. I want to ask you this morning, do you have the blood applied? Have you applied that blood this morning? The only way you can protect yourself, your heart, your mind, your soul, your very life, is to have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart, to the doorposts of your heart today. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Purifies us from all sin. Only, only through the blood of Jesus. Only through the blood of Jesus. So how do you do that? How do you apply the blood? We're not going to ask you to go out and kill a lamb this morning. None of us have. Thank God we don't live back then, right? We don't have to do that to apply the blood of Jesus. How do we do that this morning? It's simply by this next verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's coming to God and saying, I confess my sin. Father, will you forgive me? Repenting from our sin, turning from our sin, turning away from our sin, and walking the other direction. It's a metamorphosis, going the other direction, saying, Jesus, I want to follow you the rest of my life. Now, in closing this morning, I'm going to do something I don't do very often. I want you all to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. If you're here this morning and you haven't done that yet, you, you don't have the blood applied to your heart, or you're not sure you've got the blood applied to your heart, and you want to make that commitment this morning, you don't want that death angel coming to your life. You don't want that death angel coming and destroying your life. See, the Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God says, if you have the blood applied, I'll protect you. I'll protect you. If you want to do that this morning, just raise your hand. If you want to make that commitment this morning, thank you, Jesus. Raise your hand. All right, praise God. All right, thank you, Jesus. The blood applied this morning. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. God, I want to thank you this morning for those who've raised their hands today. Making a new commitment with that blood applied to their doorposts. We lift them up to you, God. We pray that um, you would give them strength. Give them courage. Give them, give them boldness. Give them understanding, and understanding that what you did on the cross, yes, it does protect them. Yes, they are under the blood. When God looks down, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ on their life. Not the sin, not the hurt, not all that stuff. He sees the blood. They're covered. And when the enemy comes and tries to tempt them, they can come back to you and say, God, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. The blood's been applied. I'm under the blood. I'm under the blood. And you will give them protection because you said in your word, you said in your word, you would never leave them or forsake them. You will give them protection, Father. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God. Father, I just ask that as we go from this place today, you would help each one of us to spread that word to everyone we possibly can, that it's only, it's only through the blood of Jesus that we can be saved. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name.
Most of you know I just spent some time in Nicaragua. Menno and I went to Nicaragua last week and spent a few days down there. So I just want to give you a little bit of an update of, um, about Nicaragua. just want to spend a few minutes. I've got some pictures. Uh, we've, we went down there, first of all, to, uh, to just check up on some things and uh, some projects we've got going on down there. We've been going to Nicaragua since 2009. Uh, one of the first things we did was we met with the, uh, the committee who took, takes care of the microloans. If you remember, a couple years ago, we took down $2,500 and we put it into an account and we have a, a team down there that oversees that. And the idea was to take that money and to loan it out in small, small loans to people to help start a business or improve a business. Because, you know, how do we help these people get out of their poverty? They are, it seems like they're locked in that poverty. And, and sometimes just a little bit of money to get them over the hump will, will make a di big difference. So in this picture, the guy uh, sitting at the end of the table, there's Antonio. And he's the guy that uh, has been handling a lot of that. And a sharp young man, he's, he also works there at the Compassion Project. And he had a laptop computer. He did a nice spreadsheet for me. If you go to the next page, we've got, we got a spreadsheet. Um, you can't read that, obviously. But it's, uh, he did a very nice spreadsheet of what they've done with that money over the last two years. And uh, I, mean, I was amazed at the results they've gotten. Out of that $2,500 that we took down, they've made 56 loans, okay? Average loan, si loan size is $187. Now, if you, if you do the math, that's over $10,000 that they've loaned out, okay, from that original $2,500. So some of that money has come back in, and they've rolled it and loaned it out to new people. And uh, so that's, that's capitalism at work. And also through that process, to qualify for a loan, they have to go through some classes. Those classes teach them biblical financial principles, teach them how to save money, teach them how to uh, uh, tithe, and all these, all these kinds of things. And so that's worked out really, really well. And uh, I was really amazed at that. And, of course, my question was, okay, out of the, all those loans you've made, how many have defaulted? How many... Just you're not going to get the money back because, you know, even banks here deal with that, right? And so I discovered there's one for sure that the guy got a loan and somebody stole his money. And then he wound up moving to another community and they'll probably never get that. There's another one that's behind on making his payments. He has made some payments, but he's, having, he's, he's struggling. And so they're still hoping they'll get that money. But, uh, and it was like $100 or something. It wasn't a big amount. Um, so hopefully they'll get that back. And, and these people have used this money for uh, one lady just needed to buy some extra corn because she was making tortillas. Uh, one guy bought a, um, like one of these bicycles that it has a little cooler on it and go around selling like this little ice cream snack and stuff. Um, you know, just a lot of little things like that, but it's enough to, to start making a difference. The next thing I want to briefly touch on is last year we had, had uh, remodeled or put up a building for um, a sewing program where they can, can do some sewing there. Some of the ladies that come to the, the uh, clinic um, don't have any means of making income, so they brought in some sewing machines, and these ladies are learning how to sew. And this is one of the ladies there with her child sitting there sewing. Well, they, uh, they wanted to start making uniforms for... Compassion. Compassion said if they make uniforms for the Compassion Project, they will buy those uniforms off of them. And so they've been practicing. They've made some uniforms. And um, there's, for that particular project, there, it'll take 500 uniforms. And Compassion has said they will buy those from them. The problem they had is they didn't have the money to go out and buy the material to make the uniforms. And so we, uh, through that microloan program, we left some funds there so that they can do that, so they can buy the, the material for the uniforms. It'll be a way for them to, these ladies, to start making some income. They'll start getting paid some for every uniform that they, that they make. And it, who knows where it can go from there. It might go to where we can supply other uh, compassion projects as well in the following years. So, so that's, that's going, uh, going well. 
Um, next, we went to check on the building program that uh, was started last winter. This is actually the second location now. Our first location, we built a school, we built a, a church, and we built a, um, a clinic and, uh, and so forth. So we're kind of kind of wrapped up there. There's always uh, different things that we can do there. But So last year, uh, when the teams went down, they started on the second project. And so this is the... Um, the building, the front of the building, it's actually going to be a two-story building. This is the school, and they're, uh, they've got the first floor uh, up, getting ready to pour the floor on top of that and go on up with the second floor. And then they're also starting on the, um, on the, um, the office. Compassion has come out and told them if they get their office finished, they will officially recognize them as a Compassion site. And so they are, they are working on that. And this picture... Um, the guy on the left is Pastor Wenger. He goes out there and he works every day. Um, and then there's volunteers that show up and just help him out. And most of the volunteers work, and he tries to feed them at, at lunchtime. Well, one of the guys, he was telling us about one of the guys that comes every day. He comes every day and volunteers, and uh, all he gets out of, of it is his, his lunch. And, um, but he was struggling financially, so we said, well, okay, well, how about, how about we start paying him? Because we've done that in the past with some of the, some of the, the committed guys. We start paying them. And uh, so we asked them, what, what is a, a good wage for this guy? What's a, what's a good wage that we can pay him? We'll leave some money there with somebody we trust, and they'll pay him. And so they talked about it a little bit, and they came back to us, and they said, well, we think $37. Now, you might think $37. Is that an hour? Is that a day? No, it's $37 a week. How many of you would want to work for $37 a week? And that's five and a half days, five and a half, ten-hour days. And they're, they're excited to work for that. And we think, well, you know, surely if that's their going wage down there, and that's really a pretty good wage down there, Surely then their living expenses are less than ours. And I'll tell you, I've been to their stores down there, and you go to buy stuff in their stores down there, it's just as high as it is here or higher. How do you live on $37 a week? It's tough. It's a tough life. So <clears throat> we went from there also. Let's go to the next picture. As they were working there at that building, just off to the side there, um, they were feeding kids. They've already got kids coming to that project, and they're feeding them every day and giving them a Bible lesson and, and so forth right there in that project. The, the work is already going there. There's a church there, there's an established church there that we're helping out. From there, we went uh, the following day out to um, Las Panitas. Now, some of you that have been there have gone out to the beach, okay? That's at Las Panitas where the, where the beach is. We've gone out to the beach and there's a restaurant there where we usually have lunch and so forth, a lot of times on Sunday afternoon or something. Well, right next, and I didn't realize this place was there, but there's some half-decent houses along the beach. It's kind of a nice area. Um, well, just behind those houses, you go up a hill, and there's this community up there of some of the poorest people I've seen. Um, this is their church building, Okay. We met with a the pastor there. The pastor's been going there for three years. He has an established church there with about 20 members. And uh, this is their church building. Now, you have to understand, they're close to the beach. In fact, you can, you can see the water from there. They're up on a hill. And they get tropical storms through there. Well, every time they do, their roof blows off. You can see part of it has some plastic on it now. And, uh, and the houses um, look very similar to that. But at that church, they already have kids coming every day, coming for food. And they, they take them and they, they prepare some of that food. Remember some of that food that we prepared here last winter? Uh, they take some of that food and they, they serve it to the kids. And the next picture is their kitchen. This is where they make the food. They build a fire. They put a big kettle on the fire, and they boil the 
get get that up to boil, put that rice and and stuff in there that we that we uh, packaged up, and that's what they feed the kids. Now, one of those um, Tony was telling us about one of the projects that they'd started feeding that food to. They'd had the ch kids checked by a doctor uh, beforehand, and 69% of the children were malnourished. Uh, after feeding that food for a short period of time, they had the doctor come back, and then only 4% of the kids had signs of malnutrition. So that food is very healthy, and it makes a huge difference for these kids. Uh, the next picture is kind of interesting. These are baby cribs. Okay, this is part of the church there, and uh, they have kids come in there, and that's where they take their naps in those in those boxes. And I believe the next picture is is some of the the uh, the food that we packaged up, or some like the like the food that we packaged up here. We actually had the opportunity to deliver some of that food while we were down there. We had uh, we took some with us when we went from Managua up to Leon, and um, that's mental loading the, loading the food in the back of a pickup truck as we were there. Um, so things are happening down there. The churches are growing. Um, kids are being fed. Lives are being touched. Lives are being changed. I, I, we've been going now for six years, and I can tell you I can see a difference in the first community where we started working. I can see a difference where there used to be these stick houses with plastic wrapped around them. I'm starting to see houses with block, okay? and maybe even a concrete floor. We're starting to see some changes coming about in those, in those communities. And so um, God has, has blessed in some amazing ways. Um, but we need your help. We need your help to continue. And um, I think we should do another food pack like we did last year. Last year we raised $10,000. We packaged 35,000 meals right here in this room. And I'd like to see us be able to do that again. And uh, I think it's important because before we did that, there was no food like this going to this particular part of Nicaragua. They were supplying other areas of Nicaragua, but not to this particular part. We kind of got the ball rolling going to Lyon. And so now there's three different places that they're supplying some of this food to in the Lyon area. So I, I think we should, we should do that again. Um, also, there's going to be more money needed when the team goes down next uh, winter in February to continue the building project and complete some of the things that we've started. And now, of course, there's a third place that needs some building. And so uh, we'll see where the Lord leads there. You know, I told the people when I left down there at the last church we were at, I said, I, said, I can't promise you anything. I said, but, but I know a God. I know a God. You know, when we started this thing six years ago, we had no idea where we were going. And we stepped out in faith. We took that first step in faith. We had absolutely no idea where we were headed. And God has supplied every step of the way. And I trust he will continue to do that. And uh, however he supplies, that's what we'll do. And so uh, coming up in two weeks, uh, it's going to be another fifth Sunday. Every month that has a fifth Sunday, that last Sunday, 100% of the offering goes to the Nicaragua Fund. And so um, that will be coming up on August the 30th. Now, most of you have probably noticed, maybe some of you haven't, that we don't really take up offerings here. And, uh, you know, if you'll notice, there's offering boxes at the back that you can put your money in the offering boxes. There are several different ways that you can, can give. You can do that. Many of you don't use checks anymore or cash. You know, everything's done with a debit card or whatever. And so uh, we've got that available too at easytithe.com slash SRC. I think that's in your bulletin. And now there's another new one. Um, we have a church app. How many of you knew we had a church app? Solid Rock Chapel app. If you've got a smartphone, you can go to your app store. You can download the Solid Rock Chapel app. There's information on there. There's a blog on there. There's uh, the messages and audio on there. And then there's also a place where you can, can give. You can streamline your giving on the app as well. So all kinds of different ways to do that.